to an election? And what, kind of, what kinds of framing should we use when thinking about what is owed to users by these platforms? A rights-based framing, a market-based framing, or something else? I can think of no better place to tackle these questions than Georgetown. For over 200 years, Georgetown has been an important center of learning in this country, and its proximity to the nation's capital will help us situate this conversation in the context of our broader democracy. Georgetown also houses many schools, centers, and student organizations whose work is closely linked to today's topic. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the McCourt School of Public Policy, geopolitics that organized this event, and the graduate organization I helped co-found called the Georgetown Technology Policy Initiative. You can like us on Facebook. <laughs> Our guest is uniquely positioned to lead this conversation. As the founder of Facebook, he helped usher in the age of social media by growing the platform since 2004 to become the largest social media network on the planet. As Facebook's enduring CEO, responsible for setting the overall direction and product strategy of the company, he's playing a, cent a central role in social media's second act as it unfolds today. And so, without further ado, it is my honor to welcome to the stage Mr. Mark Zuckerberg. Hey, everyone. It's, it's really great to be here at Georgetown with all of you today. Uh, before we get started, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that uh, today we lost an icon, Elijah Cummings. Uh, he was a powerful voice uh, for equality and for social progress and for bringing people together. Back when, when I was in college, uh, our, our country had just gone to war uh, in Iraq. And the mood on our campus was disbelief. A lot of people felt like we were you know, acting without hearing a lot of important perspectives. And you know, the toll on, on soldiers and their families and our national psyche was, was severe, yet most of us felt like we were powerless to do anything about it. And I remember feeling that if more people had a voice to share their experiences, then maybe it could have gone differently. And those early years shaped my belief that giving more people a voice gives power to the powerless and pushes society to get better over time. Now, back then, I was just building an early version of Facebook for my community. But I got a chance to see my values and beliefs play out at a smaller scale. You know, when students got to express who they were and, and what mattered to them, uh, they started more student groups, they uh, organized more businesses, and you know, they even challenged some established ways of doing things around campus. And it taught me the lesson that while a lot of the world often focuses on the big events and, and institutions, the bigger story is that most progress in our lives actually comes from individuals having more of a voice. So since then, you know, I've focused on building services that do two things. Uh, give people a voice and bring people together. And these two simple ideas of voice and inclusion go hand in hand. And we've seen this throughout history, even if it doesn't always seem that way today. You know, more people being able to share their experiences and perspectives has always been necessary to build a more inclusive society. And it is our commitment to each other uh, that we hold each other's right to express ourselves and, and be heard above our own desire to always get our way in every debate. Uh, that's how we make progress together. But this view is, is increasingly being challenged. Uh, now, uh, some people believe that giving more people a voice is driving division rather than bringing people together. Uh, more people across the spectrum uh, believe that achieving the political outcomes that they think matter is more important than every person uh, having a, a voice and being heard. And I think that that's dangerous. So today, I want to talk about why and some of the important choices around free expression that I think that we face going forward. Throughout history, we, we've seen how being able to use your voice 
how people being able to use their voice helps people come together. And we've seen this in the civil rights movement. Frederick Douglass once called uh, free expression the great moral renovator of our society. He said, slavery cannot tolerate free speech. Civil rights leaders argued time and again that their protests were a protected form of expression. And one noted that nearly all of the cases involving the civil rights movement were decided on First Amendment grounds. We've seen this globally, too, where the ability to speak freely has been central to the fight for democracy worldwide. The most repressive societies have always restricted speech the most. And when people are finally able to speak, they often use their voice to call for change. In this year alone, people have used their voices to end multiple long-running dictatorships in Northern Africa. And we're already starting to hear from people whose voices had been excluded just because they were women or because they believed in democracy. Now, our idea of free expression has become much broader over even the last 100 years. Many Americans know about the Enlightenment history and how we enshrined the First Amendment into our Constitution. Uh, but fewer know uh, just how dramatically our cultural norms and legal protections uh, have expanded, even in recent history. The first Supreme Court case to seriously consider free speech in the First Amendment uh, was in 1919, uh, Schenck versus the United States. And you know, back then, uh, the First Amendment only applied to the federal government. So states could, and often did, uh, restrict your right to speak. Our ability to call out things that we felt were wrong also used to be a lot more restricted. You know, libel laws used to impose damages if you said something negative about someone, even if it was uh, true. The standard then shifted, so that way it was OK as long as you could prove that your critique was true. And we didn't get the broad free speech protections that we have now until the 1960s, when the Supreme Court ruled in opinions like New York Times versus Sullivan uh, that you can criticize public figures as long as you're not doing so with actual malice even if what you're saying is false. So we now have significantly broader power to call out things that we feel are unjust and share our own personal experiences. And we see movements like Black Lives Matter and Me Too uh, spread and, and go viral on Facebook. Uh, the hashtag Black Lives Matter was actually mentioned for the first time on Facebook. And this just wouldn't have been possible in the same way before. You know, just 100 years back, uh, many of the stories that people are sharing now would have been against the law to even write down. And of course, without the internet, they certainly wouldn't have reached so many people. So with Facebook today, more than 2 billion people now have a greater opportunity to express themselves and to, to help others. Now, while it's easy to focus on the, the big social movements, I think it's important to remember that most progress happens in our individual lives. It's the Air Force moms who start a Facebook group so that their children and other service members who can't come home for the holidays have a place to go. It's the, the church group uh, that uh, comes together after the hurricane to provide food and to volunteer to help uh, rebuild. It's the small business on the corner that now has access to the same sophisticated tools that only the big guys used to have access to. So now you know, they can get their voice out to reach customers, uh, create more jobs in their town, and become a social hub in their community. Progress and social cohesion come from billions of stories like this happening all around the world. People having the power to express themselves at scale is a new kind of force in the world. It is a fifth estate alongside the other power structures in our society. And you know, people no longer have to rely on traditional gatekeepers in politics or media to make their voices heard. And, and that has important consequences. And I understand the concerns uh, that people have about how tech platforms have, have centralized power. But I actually believe that the much bigger story is how much these platforms have decentralized power by putting it directly into people's hands. It's, it's part of this amazing expansion of voice that we've experienced through law and culture and now technology as well. So giving people a voice and broader inclusion go hand in hand. And the trend has certainly been towards us getting much greater voice over time. But there's also an important counter trend, which is that in times of social tension, our impulse is often to pull back on free expression. 
Because we want the progress that comes from, from free expression, but we don't want the tension. We saw this when Martin Luther King Jr. wrote his famous letter from a Birmingham jail where he was unconstitutionally jailed for protesting peacefully. You know, we saw this in the effort to shut down campus protests during the Vietnam War. We saw this way back when America was deeply polarized about its role in World War I, and the Supreme Court ruled at the time that uh, the socialist leader Eugene Debs could be imprisoned for making an anti-war speech. In the end, all of these decisions were wrong. Pulling back on free expression wasn't the answer, and in fact, it often ends up hurting the minority views that we seek to protect. Now, from where we are today, it seems obvious that, of course, protests for civil rights or, or making a speech against a war should be allowed, yet this desire to suppress this expression was felt deeply by a lot of society at the time. And today, we are in another moment of social tension. We face real issues that are going to take a long time to work through. Massive economic transitions from globalization and technology. Fallout that remains from the 2008 financial crisis. Very polarized reactions to social issues and, and greater migration, not just here, but across the EU and, and around the world. And you know, many of our issues flow downstream from these changes. And in the face of these tensions, once again, a popular impulse is to pull back on free expression. We are at another crossroads. We can either continue to stand for free expression, understanding its messiness, but believing that the long journey towards greater progress requires confronting ideas that challenge us. Or we can decide that the cost is simply too great. And I'm here today because I believe that we must continue to stand for free expression. Now, at the same time, I know that free expression has never been absolute. Right? There, there are some people who argue that internet platforms should allow all uh, expression that is protected under the First Amendment, even though the First Amendment explicitly doesn't apply to companies. Now, I'm proud that our values at Facebook are inspired by the American tradition, which is more supportive of free expression than anywhere else in the world. But even American tradition recognizes that some speech infringes on other people's rights. Yet still, a strict First Amendment standard might require us to allow things like terrorist propaganda or bullying people that almost everyone agrees that we should stop, and I certainly do, as well as content like pornography that would just make a lot of people uncomfortable using our platforms. So once we're taking this content down, the question is, where do you draw the line? So most people would agree with the principle that you should be able to say things that people don't like, but you shouldn't be able to say things that put other people in real danger. And the shift over the last several years is that more people today would argue that uh, more speech is dangerous now than would have just uh, several years back. So this raises this question of exactly what counts as dangerous speech online and I would like to spend some time examining that in detail today. So many of the arguments about online speech are related to new properties of the internet itself. You know, if you believe that the internet is completely different from everything that comes before it, then it doesn't make much sense to focus a lot on historical precedent. But I believe that we need to be careful about such overly broad arguments because uh, they've been made about pretty much every new technology, from the printing press to the radio to the television. Instead, I think that we need to consider the specific ways that the internet is different and how internet services like ours might address those risks while still protecting free expression. So perhaps the clearest uh, difference with the internet is that now a lot more people have a voice in almost half of the world's population. And that is dramatically empowering for all the reasons that I've mentioned. But inevitably, some people are going to use their voice to try to organize violence, uh, to try to undermine elections, to, to hurt others. And we have a responsibility to address these risks. Because when you're serving billions of people, even if a very small percent of them cause harm, that can still be a lot of harm. So we need to address that. And we build specific systems to address each type of harmful content from incitement of violence to, to child exploitation to other kinds of harm like intellectual property violations. It's, it's about 20 categories in total. 
And we judge ourselves uh, by the prevalence of harmful content on our services and by the percent of that content that we find proactively before anyone has to report it to us. So for example, our AI systems identify 99% of the terrorist content that we take down before anyone even sees it. So uh, to do this, that is a massive investment. Right? We now have more than 35,000 people working on security, and our security budget today is greater than the whole revenue of our company was when we had our IPO earlier this decade. Now all this work, though, is about enforcing our existing policies, right? not necessarily broadening our definition of what we consider dangerous. And I think that if we do this well, we will be able to stop a lot of harm while also fighting back against putting additional restrictions on speech. A second important difference with the internet is how quickly ideas can now spread online. You know, most people can now get much more reach than they ever could before, and you know, this is at the heart of a lot of the positive uses of the internet. You know, it's empowering that, that anyone can now uh, start a fundraiser, share an idea, build a business, uh, or start a movement that can grow quickly. But we've seen this go the other way too. You know, most notably in 2016 when the Russian IRA uh, tried to interfere in, in our elections. Uh, but we've also seen this when uh, people share misinformation that goes viral. Now some people argue that virality itself is, is dangerous and that we need much tighter filters on, on what ideas and, and content are allowed to spread. And for misinformation, uh, we do focus on making sure that complete hoaxes don't go viral. And we especially focus on misinformation that can lead to imminent physical harm, like misleading health advice, saying if you're having a stroke, no need to go to the hospital, just prick your finger and you'll be fine. Now, that's dangerous, we need, we need to address that. But more broadly, uh, we've actually found that a different strategy works best. And that is focusing on the authenticity of the speaker rather than trying to judge the content itself. You know, much of the content that uh, those Russian accounts shared uh, was distasteful, but it would have been considered permissible political discourse if it had been shared by uh, real American citizens. So the real issue is that it was posted by fake accounts that were coordinating together and, pre being, and pretending to be people that they were not. And we've seen similar issues with these groups that pump out misinformation like spam just to make money. So the solution here is to verify the identities of anyone who's getting a wide amount of distribution and to get a lot better at identifying and taking down fake accounts. So we now require you to provide a government ID and to prove your location if you want to run political ads or if you're going to run a large page. You can still say controversial things if you want but you have to stand behind them with your real identity and face accountability. Our AI systems have also gotten a lot more advanced at, at detecting clusters of, of fake accounts uh, that aren't behaving the way that, that people would. You know, so we now remove billions of fake accounts a year, you know, mostly within minutes of, of signing up and before they really have a chance to do very much. So focusing on authenticity and verifying accounts um, has been a much better solution than an ever-expanding definition of what is and is not harmful content. Now, another qualitative difference is that the internet lets people form communities that, that wouldn't have been possible before. And you know, this is good in a lot of ways because it helps people find groups uh, where they belong and, uh, and share interests and, and, and can meet other people. But the flip side of this is that it has the potential to lead to polarization. And I care a lot about this because, you know, after all, our goal is to bring people together. Now, much of the research that I've seen on this is, is actually mixed. And, and, um, and a lot shows that, in some ways, the internet can actually decrease aspects of polarization. The most polarized voters in the last presidential election uh, were actually the people who were least likely to use the internet much at all. Research from the Reuters Institute also shows that you know, people who get their news online have much more diverse media diets and, and are exposed uh, to a much broader range of content than people who don't. And you know, this is because most people you know, just watch a, a couple of uh, cable news stations or, or read you know, a couple of newspapers. But you know, even if most of your friends online have similar views, uh, some don't. And you're going to get exposed to, to different perspectives through them. Still, we, we also have an important role in designing our systems to show 
uh, diversity of ideas and to make sure that we're not encouraging polarizing content. Now one last difference with the internet that I want to talk about is that it lets people share things that would have been impossible to capture and share before. You know, so take live streaming, for example. You know, this allows you know, families to be together for uh, moments like birthdays. We, we've even had a few weddings. Uh, it allows school teachers to, to read to children uh, bedtime stories who might not otherwise be read to. And of course, it's allowed us to witness some really important cultural moments. But we've also seen people broadcast uh, self-harm and, and suicide and uh, some terrible acts of violence. And these are new challenges. And our responsibility is to build systems that can respond quickly. And we're particularly focused here on well-being, especially for young people. We built a team of thousands of people and AI systems that can now detect risks of self-harm within minutes so we can reach out to people when they need that help most. In the last year, uh, we've helped first responders reach people who needed help thousands of times. So for each of these issues, I believe that we have two responsibilities. To remove content when it can cause real danger as effectively as we can, and to fight to uphold as wide of a definition of freedom of expression as possible, and to not allow the definition of what is considered dangerous to expand beyond what is absolutely necessary. And that's what I'm committed to. So these are, are new properties of the internet. But there are also shifting cultural sensitivities and diverging views on what content people consider dangerous. So take misinformation. You know, no one tells us uh, that they want to see misinformation. Right? That's why we work with independent fact checkers to stop hoaxes that are going viral from spreading. But misinformation is a pretty broad category. A lot of people like satire, which isn't necessarily true. A lot of people talk about their experiences by telling stories that may be exaggerated or, or have inaccuracies, but, but speak to a deeper truth than our lived experience. And I think we need to be careful about restricting that. And even when there is a common set of facts, uh, different media outlets often tell very different stories, emphasizing different angles and, and, and aspects of, of, of the story. So there's a lot of nuance here. And while I certainly worry about an erosion of truth, I don't think most people want to live in a world where you can only post things that tech companies judge to be 100% true. So we recently clarified our policies to ensure that People can see primary source speech from political figures that, that shapes our civic discourse. You know, political advertising is more transparent on Facebook than anywhere else. And we keep all political and issue ads in an archive so everyone can scrutinize them for years to come. And that's something that no TV or print does. Now, we don't, we don't fact check political ads. And we don't do this to help politicians, but because we think people should be able to see for themselves what politicians are saying. And for the same reason, if content is newsworthy, we also won't take it down even if it would otherwise conflict with some of our standards. Now, I know many people disagree with this. But in general, I don't think it's right for a private company to censor politicians or the news in a democracy. And we are not an outlier here. You know, the other major internet platforms and the vast majority of media also run these same ads. American tradition also has some precedent here. Uh, the Supreme Court case I mentioned earlier that gave us our current broad speech rights was actually a case about an ad with misinformation in it. It was uh, an ad supporting Martin Luther King Jr. and criticizing the Alabama Police Department. And the police commissioner sued the, the Times. Uh, the jury in Alabama found against the Times. And then the Supreme Court unanimously reversed that decision, creating today's speech standard. So as a principle, in a democracy, I believe that people should decide what is credible, not tech companies. Now, of course, there are exceptions. And even for politicians, we're not going to allow content that incites violence or, or risks imminent harm. And of course, we don't allow voter suppression. Voting is voice. Fighting voter suppression is as important for the civil rights movement as free expression has been. And just as we are inspired by the First Amendment, we're inspired by the 15th Amendment, too. Now, you know, given the sensitivity around political ads, I've considered uh, whether we should stop you know, allowing them altogether. 
from a business perspective, you know, the controversy certainly is not worth the very small part of our business that they make up. But political ads can be an important part of voice, you know, especially for uh, local candidates and up and coming challengers and advocacy groups and the media might not otherwise cover, so that way they can get their voice into the debate. Banning political ads favors incumbents and whoever the media chooses to cover. But practically, even if we wanted to ban political ads, it's not even clear where you draw the line. Right, there are many more ads about issues than there are directly about elections. Would we ban ads about healthcare or immigration or women's empowerment? And if you're not gonna ban those, does it really make sense to give everyone else a voice in political debates except for the candidates themselves? So there are gonna be issues any way you cut this. And I believe that when it's not absolutely clear what to do, that we should err on the side of greater expression. Or let's take hate speech, which we define as someone directly attacking a person or group uh, based on a characteristic like race, gender, or religion. You know, we take down content uh, that could lead to real world violence. And in countries at risk of conflict, or where there is a conflict, that includes anything that could lead to imminent violence or genocide. And we also know from history that the dehumanizing people is often the first step towards inciting violence. So if you say immigrants are vermin or all Muslims are terrorists, you know, that makes other people feel like they can escalate and attack that group without consequences. So we don't allow that. You know, I, I, I take this really seriously. And, and we work really hard to get this off of our platform. American free speech tradition recognizes that some speech can have the effect of restricting others' right to speak. And while American law doesn't recognize hate speech as a category, it does prohibit racial harassment and sexual harassment, we still have a very strong culture of free speech even while our laws clearly prohibit discrimination. But still, you know, people have broad disagreements over what qualifies as hate and should be allowed. Some people think that our policies don't prohibit content that they think qualifies as hate, while others think that uh, some of what we take down should be a protected form of expression. You know, this has been uh, one of the hardest categories to get right. Now, I believe that, that people should be able to use our services to discuss issues that they feel strongly about, from religion and immigration to foreign policy and crime. And I think you should even be able to be critical of groups without dehumanizing them. But even this, isn't, it always, it's not always straightforward to judge or implement at scale, and, and it can often lead to some unfortunate enforcement mistakes on our part. You know, is someone uh, reposting that video of a racist attack because they're condemning it? Or are they glorifying it and hoping that people copy it? Are they using normal offensive slang? Or are they now using an innocent word in a new way, hoping to incite violence or even genocide? Now, multiply those linguistic challenges by more than 100 languages around the world where we operate. Rules about what you can and can't say often have unintended consequences. You know, when speech restrictions were implemented in the UK in the last century, uh, Parliament noted that they were often applied more heavily to citizens from poorer backgrounds because the way they expressed things didn't match the elite Oxbridge style. And I believe that in everything we do, we need to make sure that we are empowering people and not simply reinforcing existing institutions and power structures. So that brings us back to the crossroads that we find ourselves at today. Are we gonna continue fighting to give more people a voice to be heard? Or are we going to pull back from free expression? Now I see three major threats ahead. The first is legal. And we're increasingly seeing laws and regulations around the world that undermine free expression and people's human rights. And these local laws are each individually troubling, especially when they shut down speech in places where there isn't democracy or freedom of the press. But it's even worse when countries try to impose their speech restrictions on the rest of the world. So this raises the larger question about the future of our global internet. You know, China is building 
its own internet focused on, on very different values. And it's now exporting their vision of the internet to other countries. Now until recently, the internet in almost every country outside of China has been defined by American platforms with strong free expression values. But there's no guarantee that these values will win out. A decade ago, almost all of the major internet platforms were American. Today, six of the top 10 are Chinese. And we're beginning to see this in social media too. While our services like WhatsApp are used by protesters and activists everywhere due to strong encryption and privacy protections, on TikTok, the Chinese app growing quickly around the world, mentions of these same protests are censored, even here in the US. Is that the internet that we want? So this is one of the reasons why we don't operate Facebook, Instagram, or our other services in China. You know, I, I wanted our services in China because I believe in connecting the whole world and I thought you know, maybe we could help create a more open society. And this is something that I worked hard on for a long time. But we could never come to agreement on, on what it would take for us to operate there and, and they never let us in. And now, uh, we have more freedom to speak out and stand up for the values that we believe in and fight for free expression around the world. So this question of which nation's values are going to determine what speech is allowed for decades to come really puts into perspective our debates about the content issues of the day. Because while we may disagree on exactly where to draw the line on specific issues, we at least can disagree. That's what free expression is. And the fact that we can even have this conversation means that we're at least debating from some common values. If another nation's platform set the rules, our discourse can be defined by a completely different set of values. So to push back on this, you know, as our policymakers work to define internet policy and regulation, to address public safety and the important social issues, I think that we should also be proactive and write policy that helps the values of voice and expression triumph around the world. The second challenge to expression is from the platforms themselves, including us. Because the, the reality is, is that we make a lot of decisions that affect people's ability to speak. Now I'm committed to the values that we're discussing today, but, but we won't always get it right. I understand that, that, that people are concerned about how much control we have over how people communicate on our services, and, and I understand people are concerned about bias and, and making sure that their ideas are, are treated fairly. And frankly, I don't think that we should be making so many important decisions about speech on our own either. You know, we'd benefit from a more democratic process and clearer rules for the internet and, and some new institutions. So that's why we're establishing an independent oversight board for people to appeal our content decisions. The board is gonna have the power to make final binding decisions about whether content stays up or comes down across our services. And these are gonna be decisions that our team and I cannot overturn. And we're gonna appoint members to this board who have a, a diversity of views and backgrounds, but who each hold free expression as a paramount value. Now building this institution is important to me personally because I'm not always gonna be here. And I wanna ensure that these values of voice and free expression are enshrined deeply into how this company is governed. Now the third challenge to expression is the hardest because it actually comes from our culture itself. We are at a moment of particular tension here and around the world, and we are seeing the impulse to restrict speech and enforce new norms on what people can and cannot say. And increasingly, you know, we're seeing people across the spectrum try to define more speech as dangerous because it may lead to political outcomes that they see as un unacceptable. Some hold the view that since the stakes are now so high, they can no longer trust their fellow citizens with the power to communicate and to decide what to believe for themselves. I personally believe that this is more dangerous for democracy over the long term than almost any speech. 
Democracy depends on the idea that we hold each other's right to express ourselves and be heard above our desire to always get the outcomes that we want. You can't impose tolerance top down. It has to come from people opening up, sharing experiences, and developing a shared story for our society that we all feel like we're a part of. That's how we make progress. So how do we turn the tide? Well, someone once told me that our founding fathers thought that free expression was like air. You don't miss it until it's gone. When people don't feel like they can express themselves, they lose faith in democracy and are more likely to support populist parties that prioritize specific policy outcomes over the health of our democratic and civic norms. I'm a little more optimistic. I don't think we need to lose our freedom of expression to realize how important it is. I think that people get it and, and understand and appreciate the voice that they have now. And at some fundamental level, I think that most people believe in their fellow people too. And as long as our governments respect people's right to express themselves, as long as our platforms live up to their responsibilities to support expression and prevent harm, and as long as we all commit to being open and making space for more perspectives, but I think we're going to make progress. It's going to take time, but I think that we're going to work through this moment. We overcame deep polarization after World War I and intense political violence in the 1960s. Progress isn't linear. You know, sometimes we have to take two steps forward and one step back. But if we can't agree to let each other talk about the issues, then we can't even take the first step. So even when it's hard, this is how we build a shared understanding. So yes, we have big disagreements, maybe more now than at any time in recent history. But part of this is because we're getting our issues out on the table, issues that for a long time weren't talked about enough. More people from more parts of our society now have a voice than ever before, and it's going to take time to hear all these voices and knit them together into a coherent narrative. Sometimes we hope uh, for a, a singular event to come along and resolve these conflicts, but that's never been how it works. We focus on the major institutions, our government, the large companies, but the bigger story has always been regular people using their voice to take billions of individual steps forward to make all of our lives and our communities better. The future depends on all of us. And whether you like Facebook or not, I think we need to recognize what is at stake and come together to stand for voice and free expression at this critical moment. I believe in giving people a voice because at the end of the day, I believe in people. And as long as enough of us keep fighting for this, I believe that more people's voices will eventually help us work through these issues together and write a new chapter in our history where from all of our individual voices and perspectives, we can bring the world closer together. Thank you.